We thank you for today's privilege to stand in your presence, to know what you have in store for us. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for understanding. We thank you for your people who have come to listen to the sound of your voice. As many that are sick, we thank you for your healing mercy. As many that sat in darkness, we thank you for the shining of your light. For as many, O oh Lord, who are seeking for the fruit of the womb, we stand upon the authority of the word of God and we proclaim there is no barren in the land. And none among us will cast this young. Father, we thank you for as many, O oh Lord, who are looking up to God and saying, O oh Lord, I need help with my business. I need help with my finance. I need help in time of affliction. But the Lord today has marked the end of their suffering. Because light will shine out of obscurity. Hope will come out of darkness. Father, you are the Lord. And that is your name. Your glory cannot be given to another. Your praise can never be given to demons. Lord, the hour has come. Let your name be glorified. Let the sons of God possess their possession. O oh Lord, arise and shine in the midst of us because our light has come. Because the glory of the Lord has risen upon his church. Brethren, welcome to this open house fellowship. This is our opportunity to train the trainers. This is normally our preparation class where we use opportunity to train people who are meant to train others, the part of the Lord. Just like the Bible said, iron sharpens iron. So does a man sharpen the countenance of his brother. For no man is an island of knowledge. We learn from each other, and that's how we grow. Today, we are looking at the topic, hope in darkness. Hope in darkness. Something, sometime in our life, we find ourselves in a gross darkness, a place where no light is at all. And when we mean no light, that means there is no sense of direction. You don't know where to go. When you turn right, all you see is darkness. When you turn left, all you see is emptiness and obscurity. Because darkness has a way of hiding things from our physical eyes. When we are in darkness, we find it difficult to see things that already exist. When we are in darkness, we cannot have clear pictures of our surroundings. We don't know what we can see. And because we can't see it, we can't believe in it. And because we can't believe in it, we can't command it to existence. And that's what darkness do to us. And so when we come to some situation, what are we expected to do? Can our hope grow in the midst of darkness? Can our hope stay first when every light around us is gone? The situation becomes so hopeless. When we are forced to use negative words on ourselves. Sometimes you look at your life and you said, my life is just hopeless. Because there is nothing to hope for. That's because darkness covers the hope. And light can shine in the midst of that darkness. Today I'm telling you, all it takes to bring hope to your darkness is to allow the Spirit of God to hover over the surface of your darkness. Because it takes the Spirit of God to bring hope out of hopeless situation. It takes the Spirit of God to bring light out of darkness. Without the Holy Spirit, our darkness is going to be so dark to the extent we are not even going to be able to see the sense of our direction. And that's why we as humans need the Holy Spirit. Because when the Comforter will come, Christ says, He will open our eyes. And He will make known to us the thing that Christ 
has indeed taught us. Without the Holy Spirit, the earth would live in gross darkness. We will be without hope. Even when we try to find hope, it becomes useless because we can't see. And because we can't see, we cannot check for direction. And because we cannot check for direction, our paths are clear. And the Lord is looking at us and is asking one simple question. If only you can see your paths, you would have known that I have made all things new. If only you can know your direction, then you would have known there is a highway through the wilderness. If only you knew that I have created a path through the sea, then you could have walked through the sea as a dry land. If you have known that I control the waters in Jordan, then you would have known that Jordan has dried up. But because your eyes are deaf, are blind, your ears are deaf, and you cannot hear his sounds, you cannot listen, neither can you comprehend with your eyes. And now, all parts around you seems lost. We have an example in the scriptures, a woman named Hagar. She was so hopeless. To the extent she cast away her child and said, God, don't let me see the death of this lad. <coughs> One thing <coughs> was unique about Hagar. Hagar was not an Israelite. He was not the offspring of Abraham. He was not from Haran, he was from Egypt. But he has stayed long in the house of his master to learn one or two things about God. The God of his master, Abraham, is a just God. The God that has no respect of person. The God that answers when prayed upon. The God that does not regard personality. And say, this is a servant. <coughs> I will pay no attention to her. And when Hagar knew such situation, he realized, yes, I know I will soon die. I know the bottle of water my master gave me when he sent me away is spent. I know that I'm with a child that my master's, that belongs to my master. But I don't want to see the death of this child. He cast the child far away off. And he went a stone try. Then he wept. And the Bible said the tears covered her eyes. And the tears were so much that she could not see her front. But the Lord, who sees the heart, who knows the thoughts of the mind, saw the situation. And he was willing to help. First, he sent the Spirit of God to open her eyes. Because when darkness covers your eyes, you cannot see the things that surround you. And what happened? Hagar's eyes was open to see a well. Where she can fetch water and give to the Lord. So that the Lord will survive. Because the promise that God was going to give to the Lord will profit the Lord nothing if the Lord is dead. And so many of us are like that today. God has promised us an amazing and wonderful promises. But what use will those promises be when we are dead? Oh, we dreamt one day we are going to build a house on a hill, fly to around the world, preach in large congregation. What use will your vision be if the vision meets you in the grave? What use will your dream be 
if the enemy snatch it away half inch to the vision. That's why the Bible says we have need of patience. After we have done the work so that we can inherit the blessing. You can plan, have the plan to change the fate of human race. If you don't live to accomplish it, your dreams is as good as dead. You better live to accomplish the vision God has given you. If not, you just wasted the vision and you wasted the gift of God upon your life. So God did not want the vision of the young lads to be wasted. He wanted his hand to be against every man and every man's hand to be against him. That was part of his vision. And he was going to give birth to seven princes. And the lads have to be alive to accomplish that. Indeed, he gave birth to seven princes. Today, every man's hand is against him. And his hand is against every man. Because the vision came to pass. All thanks to the Holy Spirit, who opened the eyes of Hagar to see it well in front of her. If not, Hagar and the Lord would have perished in the desert. And God is saying this thing to you today. Now let's go to the creator of all things. Somebody will ask, God is the creator. It's not possible for God to need hope. What will he need hope for? He is the creator. He is the giver of hope. But I tell you, let's go to the book of Genesis, the beginning of all things. And see whether God need hope or not. <clears throat> In Genesis 1. Genesis 1. <clears throat> from verse 2 and 3. The Bible said the earth was without form and void. And what happened to darkness? Darkness was on top of the face of the deeps. And the Spirit of the Lord move on the faces of water. Whenever I come to this place, it gets strange. Because the Bible told me God is the God that called those things that are not as though they are. <coughs> and they came to be. But whenever I read this place, it doesn't sound like the voice of an optimist. It sounds like the voice of somebody who who saw trouble. You know, some people don't understand. Faith does not deny reality. There is nothing wrong when you are sick and you say you are sick. And there is nothing also wrong when you are sick, you say, by his stripes I am healed. And there is nothing wrong when you are poor and broke, you say, I'm poor, I don't have anything. But there is nothing also wrong when you are poor and broke, when you say, I am rich. Because the Bible says, let the poor say they are rich. But confession without faith is meaningless. Your confession should be based on faith and holding on to the divine promise of God. And that's when your confession brings forth strength. And the Lord expects you to confess such things. But this man, God, saw the earth as empty, ruins, void, formless, amorphous, something shapeless. And God said, something must be done. And I don't believe that was the first day he saw it. He may have seen it many days, and see that it does not disturb his existence. And as long as God kept quiet, the situation remained. And that's the thing I'm going to teach you about today. A 
as long as you see darkness around you and you ignore it as if it is nothing, the situation of that darkness is going to remain. But one day you are going to wake up and say, let's do something about this darkness. It's just like when you start building a house. You finish up everything in the house. And you discover there is no single atom of light in the night in the house. And one day you woke up and said, let's wire the house. And when you wire the house, there's still no light in the house. You say, let's put some bulb. And you did so. But still, there is no light. That's why there is every architect to bring light to the house. Yet light does not exist. Because for light to come, it has to be connected to a power source. And that is electricity. The same thing God did here. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit did the wiring of the earth. And that is the next point we are going to go to. The Bible says in verse 2, The earth, though it was formless and void and darkness, on the face on the depths, the Spirit of God move over the surface of water. How did we know there was water? The Holy Spirit. How did we know that the house was wired? The electrician. Without the electrician, we will never know that the house was wired. Without the Holy Spirit, we will never find hope in darkness. That's why when you come to a Christian funeral and you go to one believer funeral, you see two different things entirely. One is jumping up and hitting his head on the ground and saying, my brother or my sister is dead. The other one is saying, let's praise and let's rejoice because our sister is sleeping and he will wake when the Lord returns. What are the differences? One is asleep because he knows the truth. The other one is dead because he has no hope. And even when he wakes up on the last day, all that is before him is utter darkness. And the Lord is saying, which of these two do you want to be? You want to be the one that dies or the one that is asleep? And God, in the same vein, has the Holy Spirit for a guide. Because the Spirit of God was on the surface of the water. Do you have the Spirit of God hovering over your program? The Bible told us when we don't know how to pray as we're supposed to, we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And when the Spirit of God say, Abba, Father, ah, the Holy Spirit is testifying that this is indeed a child of God who need God's support, who need God's help, who need God's determination, who need God and torment, who needs, whose problem need to be fixed by God. And that's why sometimes in your deep of sleeps, when you don't know what to do, you are confused about situation. You heard the Holy Spirit vibrating in your head, blasting in tongues. It's not because you are speaking in tongues from the from your mouth. No, your mind is speaking in tongues. Because we have the mind of God. The Bible says, who has the mind of God? That he might, un he might instruct him, tell him what he needs to do. But we have the mind of Christ. So we can instruct God. We can tell God what we want Him to do for us. We can stand in the midst of affliction and bring light to our darkness. We can walk through the darkest of dark nights and light will shine in our front. We can be thrown into a pit, a stock where we cannot move our body, but we will have God as our comfort. We can be thrown into the lion den. The lion will say, this is not meat. A friend has just come. Because you are the offspring of the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
You can be thrown into the fire, heated seven times. It will become like air condition because the Lord Jesus is in your midst. Because he told me clearly that when I go through the fire, no matter how hot it is, it will not consume me. And he told me clearly when I go through the water, no matter how deep it is, it will not overwhelm me. So that is the comfort that I had in him. I don't know about you. What are you going through? That is fire condition. And the condition is like somebody thrown into the fire. When you seek for help, you get conk. And when you want peace, you get trouble. And when you stretch out your hand for friendship, you get enemy draw your hand. And when you say, give me water, poison is served to you. And when you sought for food, they give you scorpion. And when you say, let me just lie down and relax, you lie on top of a serpent. Everything around you is dead. And when you turn around, all you can see are the hanged men who are with rope to hang you. And you say, well, God has forgotten me. My life is over. There is no body that will deliver me from this. But you, right there, you hear the Spirit of God whisper, that's not true. And it says to you, that's not true. I am your comforter. I will never leave you comfortless. Because you didn't suffer for his guidance. You didn't ask him to hover over the waters. You didn't tell him to hover over your problem and find solution. Sometimes when we are grieved and people really hurt us, the first thing we think about as human is revenge, anger, pains, affliction, and sorrow. But God is telling us something. Instead of thinking about what you can do for yourself, Think about what God can do for you. Think about what God will do if he's in that same situation. Jesus was in a situation also where people he helped, they rejected him. They look at him on the cross. They say, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross by yourself. I will believe in you. And they look at him and they say within themselves, Oh, sorry. He saved others, but he could not save himself. Are your friends telling you the same thing? Oh, when I was hungry, you gave me food. Now you are hungry, you could not feed yourself. And that is their comfort instead of giving you food. When you are thirsty, and they look at you and they should wake up their head. And they say, he gave other people water to drink. Now he is tasty. He has no water. And that becomes your comfort. The Lord said, don't look at the face of men. Look into the face of the Lord. Like your Lord Jesus did. When they said to him, he saved others. He could not save himself. What did he see? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Commit your ways unto the Lord. Because the Bible says, in all your way, acknowledge God. Lean not upon your own understanding. Acknowledge God and he will direct your paths. Because the path of a good man are not ordered by his strength. They are not ordered by his wisdom. They are not ordered by how much educated he is. They are not ordered by how many exposure he has in the society. But the step of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Lord is the one who is able to order the step of a good man. When you see a man and you say that man is a good man, 
Check his footstep. They are ordered by the Lord. And when God sees himself in the same situation, and God did not faint, he did not say, an enemy has done this, let's carry weapon, let's go and destroy the enemy, and leave the problem there. There are so many of us who would rather kill the wish rather than fix the trouble in their house. There are so many of us who will rather go for war rather than fix trouble in their house. Oh, he killed my son. Instead of waking the boy up, you gather people up for battle. Let's go and fight that family. They killed my son. Which one would be better? Have your son back to life or take revenge on your dead son? Which one is easier to do? Vengeance or healing? But you will think of vengeance as a man because you came from the dust. The dust is at work in you. But as a God, what will you think about? Make peace. Bring the charge to me. Bring the charge to me, like the Lord Jesus said. And he wake him up. Christians sought for peace. In battle. Our strength as Christian does not rely on how many enemies we are able to kill or how many agents of darkness we are able to torment. That's not what makes us Christian. What makes us Christian is how many peace we can find in the midst of battle. How many comforts we can have in the middle of adversity. When the devil shoot at us with anger, do we respond in kind or we respond with peace? When men slap us on one cheek, do we turn the others to them or we take vengeance upon our hands? We forgot the one that said, vengeance is mine. And I will repay. Some will even say an eye for an eye. If an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. Because you obviously will not have any eye again. Because you take one eye, I take one. The other one take one eye, the other one take one eye. Everybody will become blind. Because God expects us to have better judgment than this. To resist evil. To stand tall. The Bible says to resist the devil. He will run away from you. Stand tall in the midst of adversity. Always know that mercy triumphs over judgment. The strongest people on earth and not those who can take vengeance. I know once upon a time, when we're in the mission, somebody did something terribly that was so evil to me. And the Lord said to me, take up your car, go to the person and apologize. And I said to God, this person offended me. He said, yes, I know. Why did you say I should go to him and apologize and not him coming to me? He said, because if he apologized to you, then you will not be my servant. You should do the apology, right? And I look at God. In tears, I went. And I told God, why not just give me just 30 minutes, let me deal with this person myself. I don't even need your help for this case. I can handle it myself. And the Lord looked at me. He said, no. But this is not your fight. Leave vengeance to me. Go and do what I sent you. And I did exactly as he sent me to do. And that day, before evening, the Lord himself resolved the problem. 
and it gave me hope. And since then, I have learned to listen first before I take vengeance. And listen to God and hear what He has to say. Because God's word supersedes the voice of man. The Holy Spirit whispering something to your heart is going to be the solution to that conflict that does not allow you to sleep day and night. When you begin to worry and keep trouble within your heart, day and night you do not sleep. Your enemy will fall asleep and they will sleep comfortably. Because there are some people who does not know God, even when they kill somebody, in the night they split their bed and they sleep comfortably. They don't have any trouble. But you, you are angry because he has killed your brother. He has killed your sister. And that anger will not allow you to sleep. And before you know, you have heart attack. Your enemy is alive. You are at the point of death. Instead of you killing your enemy, you are killing yourself. But the Lord said, relax. I remember one said that I was very angry. The only voice I heard from the Lord was relax. I said, relax? He said, yes, relax. Just relax. Because God expects you to relax your mind. Don't disturb your mind with things that are not necessary. God saw darkness. God saw emptiness. God saw rooms. But how did he handle it? He allows the Holy Spirit. <coughs> In the ministry, all things are not cough case and sweetness. There's going to be time where you are going to send suffering. Deaths, affliction, pains, torture. Vengeance from the enemy. <clears throat> you are going to be so mad. To the essence, you want to throw away your Bible. Like one pastor once said, I will put Bible away and deal with you. You will want to take Bible away first. And deal with the person. Come back to God later and repent. The devil is going to promote, provoke you to that limit. But God said it is not a time for that. It is time to consult the Holy Spirit. Allow him to hover over this problem. And let him bring a solution. I have grown to understand for the past 30 years. That the solution of the Holy Spirit are better than any solution from an expert. He will give you solution. He will make of your trouble a quick end. Now, what did God do in the face of darkness? First, he allowed the Spirit of God to move upon the faces of waters. What should you do in your time of adversity? Allow the Holy Spirit in you, if you are filled with it, to move on the surface of the trouble. Let it give you suggestion. Be wise enough to listen to his suggestion. And stop when he told you stop. Because each time I fall into sin, I discover I did not listen to the Holy Spirit when he says stop. I still say I will go forward. That is when I fall into sin. But when God says stop, you should stop. Don't move forward. When he said go, go. When he said stop, stop. When David men rose up against him, after he came back from the battle, and his men rose up against him because the enemy has taken their wife and children, Kati. What did David do? His men pick up stone to stone him. The devil not say, did I not go to battle with you? Why do you want to stop me? Was I around? Did I allow your wife and children to be taken? Did he shit brain? Or did he look for who to blame? 
No. The Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord. He allowed the Holy Spirit to encourage him. And when the Holy Spirit did the encouragement, what did he do next? He went before God in a prayers of divination and asked, should I pursue after my enemy? If God had said, do not pursue, he would have sit down. His wife and children were taken. Why still wait for God? Why not run after the enemy with all his strength? Oh, pastor, pastor, come. My sister is at the point of death. I need you to come and pray for her. What will you do first? Are you going to say, Holy Spirit, guide me with strength. Show me what I should do in this situation. Or are you going to storm out of your house? And say, where is your sister? Let's go and heal him and see if the power come from you. What do you expect God will do if it's in your situation? Most time Jesus is called to his venue. He asks the Father and give thanks to ask heaven for permission before he does anything. Do you ask heaven for permission before leaving your house on a mission journey? Before putting a team together for prayer? Even when all the roads are dark, do you see light? Can you create hope out of hopelessness? Oh, sometime in life, there is no hope at all. God just look at a place in the highway. The nearest house is about 40 miles away. And nobody is close by, no even haunt. And the Lord said, here I want to build my church. Are you, bold, are you brave enough to listen to God? Or will you say to God, God, this village is too far from town. How can I build a church here? But God is saying to you, here, I want to build a church. I want you to build a very big church here. I want people to come from everywhere and worship here. Are you wiser than God? Obey the Spirit. The Holy Spirit told me something last year. When I was praying. And when he told me that, I believe it, and I confess it to my team. But right in my heart, after confessing it, my human spirit kicking, I asked me three questions. One, how much do you have in your account? I said zero. Do you have a job that will give you such money? I said zero. And he looked at me very well. He said, why do you believe in a lie? I said, but with God, all things are possible. Say, shut up, my friend. How can it come to pass when you have no work for it? The Bible says God bless the work of your hands. Where is the work that God is going to bless? And I look at the devil. I say, Satan, I rebuke him. If God has said it, he will bring it to pass. If he has commanded it, he will establish it. The year has not ended. We are barely half of the year. The Lord is already at the verge of fulfilling those promises. Christians should stand fast in what they believe. It doesn't matter how many enemies struck at them. God was not moved by the sight of darkness or by the amorphous situation of the earth. God was not moved by the shapelessness. God was not moved by the emptiness. God was not moved by the darkness. But in listening to the Spirit. So you should 
If God, who is the creator of heaven and earth, who raised you from dust, can listen to the spirit, you should listen to the spirit. It doesn't matter how dark your situation is. If the spirit says to you, can this boy leave? Tell him the truth. God took a, a servant of his, Ezekiah, to a valley that was full with dry bone. He wanted to raise Ezekiah hope. And Ezekiah was expecting God to take him to a wheat farm where there are so many ripe grapes. At least to raise his hope that there is going to be prosperity in Israel. But God's rider took him to a valley full of dry bones. And the Bible said when Ezekiah looked at the bones, they were very dry. <laughs> because when God wants to raise you, your hope, it takes you to a death situation. A situation where hope does not appear. Where the sea has reached your neck and the water is about to cover you up. And that is a situation where God asks you a question. Son, can my grace save it? Can this bone live? Can this affliction be rolled away? Can this problem be solved? Can this dead man rise? He has been dead now and he's sticking. Can he live again? Can this bone that is rolling like a serpent, can this bone be stretched? Can life come into this flesh? That has rotted away as a result of leprosy. Can cleanliness come into it? The Lord is asking you a question. Your answer will determine your attitude. And that is the Holy Spirit. Whispering to you. Telling you there is hope in hopeless situation. There is peace. In the middle of battle, there is abundance in the middle of suffering. And the Holy Spirit is speaking. And God is speaking to you right now. And He's asking you the same question that God asked. And the Bible said, when God listened to the Holy Spirit, He still has to do one more thing speak. The Holy Spirit can whisper all days to our life. But if we don't command it by faith, it will not happen. God can give you all the wisdom to lead your children to success. But if you don't command your children after you, they will not succeed. God can give everything to make life beautiful. But if you don't confess it, it will not come. God expects after we have hope in the midst of darkness to command darkness to become light. We need light to shine in darkness so that we can start seeing good things. Because as long as light refuses to shine, goodness cannot come from darkness. But the moment light shines in darkness, Darkness cannot overcome. God expects you to make lights come to that situation. But first, you need the Spirit to tell you the situation. There is something beneath the darkness. It takes the Spirit to have hope in darkness. And to know beyond darkness, there are furnitures. It takes the Spirit of God Let's say the Holy Spirit is the energy source that you connect your bulb to. The bulb is already in the house. The wires are already in the house. But there's still no light except it's connected to the power source. Everything to cook your food and to make your destiny well preserved and portable are already created. But except you hook it to the Holy Spirit, the light will not shine. And even after you hook it to the Holy Spirit, if you don't own the light, 
the light will not on. And for you, as a child of God, hope is not enough. You must command it. The Bible says you shall decree a thing and it will come to pass and light will shine upon your words. When the Holy Spirit is in you, he embody you. Oh, you blast the tongue from morning to night. Ah, ba, 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 ba. Without confession, the nonsense. Until you stand and says, the Bible says, let the weak says, I am strong. God, I don't care the weakness in my body. I receive strength. You will not be strengthened. Until you look at yourself and say, God, you told me by your stripes I am healed. Therefore, sickness, you cannot live in me. Today is your end. By his stripes, I am healed. You cannot be healed. I remember when the sister called to me in Germany. And he said to me, look at affliction I've endured in the church. And I look at the sister, I said to her, I said, what do you want? He said, I need a church. I said, okay. Your situation is so easy. And because it's too easy, I'm not going to attend to it. I have important things to do. He said, what is more important than my own? I said to her, I have to fix some of the papers. That is more important to me than your own. He said, I will follow you. And he went with me. And afterward, he said, now we finish. Can you pray for me? I said, no, not yet. You go and fast for three days and I'll fast for three days. And she did not give up. She said, I can't fast. I can only fast the 12. I said, just do it. I said, I will fast myself to six. You fast the 12. On the third day, let's come together and pray. On the third day, when we meet... I look up to the heaven and I said, God, there is no barren in the land. That statement would have been said the first day. It would have still had the same effect. But the Holy Spirit was there. The faith was there. The willingness was there. The only thing that was left was the word, which is the switch. And until the word comes in, the spirit cannot function. The word is the function of the spirit. And the word is the switch. And when you turn on that word, which is the switch, the spirit will come to life. And that's why God expects you to turn the word on. Today, let the word in your life be turned on. Switch it on so that that problem can be fixed. And that month did not expire. The woman said, Brother, I have not told anybody I'm pregnant. I say it to God be the glory. Indeed, after 15 years, because she trusted, I did not, it was not my prayer. She all had the ability to become pregnant all through her life. But she needed the word. First, she has the faith. Two, she had the spirit. The only thing that was needed from me was the word. And that was what I proclaimed. And it was a simple word. There is no barren in the land. I said it. I believe it. That's all. And God did the rest. All you need to survive is the word. The Bible said the word was made flesh. The word. It was not the spirit that became flesh. The word of God. The word of God gained ability. And the word could live in the midst of us. The word is power. The word is sharper than anything. Even to a sword. It can pierce every heart. It can melt every soul. Christians need the world. Let's take a short look, a quick look at the book of Isaiah. 
the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59 from verse 1. He said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot say it. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot say it. His ear are not heavy that he cannot hear you. But something is holding God from bringing solution to your problem. Darkness, sin, iniquity, abomination. These are what are holding his hands. Because darkness forbids you from seeing good things. There is good things all around us. But because we live in darkness, we cannot just see it. God, wish I wish we could see good in our home, good in our wives, good in our children, good in our academics, good in our beautiful business, finance, ministry. But we can't see it because we are covered by sin and darkness. The Bible said in verse 2, but your iniquity, but your iniquity is what is responsible. Your iniquity is the separation between you and your God. Your sin is what is covering his face that he cannot see you. Your sin is the darkness. The Bible says, if the light in you becomes darkness, how thick is that darkness? If the light in your eyes becomes darkness, the eye is the light of the body. If your eyes is blind, how gross is that darkness? You are the salt of the earth. When the salt lost its taste, it's good for nothing that will be chosen on that food by men because it becomes sand. When salt lost its taste, it becomes sand. Nobody eats salt, a saltless salt. If you lost your taste as a Christian, the devil will use you as a full step. When Christian lost his value, some people will say, don't you know? When they slap somebody, you say, don't you know I'm a believer? The day you slap somebody, that is the day you lose the title. Because when your Christianity is no longer noticed by the devil, you are good for nothing that will become his slippers. If your godliness becomes sin, you have just become a servant to the enemy. Don't allow the devil through anger push you to do things that are against God. Because it is your meekness that makes you a Christian. Characters form Christianity. So when your character is Nothing. You're, you, you are not a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you stay in the church or which title they gave you or how many cap you have on your head. It doesn't make any difference. Christianity comes from the reformation of character. And if you, are, if you said, I have been saved, but your character did not change, you are still a greedy person. You are still a jealous person. You are still a wicked person. How dwell the love of Christ in you? Where does it come from? If Christ is formed in you, it is first formed in the heart. And if Christ is not formed in the heart, it cannot clean the body. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? You have to clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may be clean also. If you don't clean the inside, the outside mark cannot be clean. So cleanliness comes from the inside. The heart of a Christian is a heart of flesh. The day you become born again, God removed the heart of stone from you. And he gave you a heart of flesh. A heart of forgiveness. 
a heart of discipline, a heart that wear action before it take consequences, a heart that is subjected to love, to pity, to comfort, to think about others' welfare before he thinks of his own. That is the heart of flesh. And that is the heart God gave you the day you become born again. And if this heart is not in you, and you claim the name, Chris, I am a Christian, you, just, you are just taking the name of your God in vain. God is saying to us, in verse 2, that iniquity is what separates you from God. Sin is what covers his face from you. That he cannot even hear you when you cry. So people will say, I'll be praying, I'll be praying. Only God does not just answer my prayer. It's like God hates me. God did not hate you. Your sin has covered his ear. And that's why he cannot hear you. In verse 3, he said, because your hands are defiled with blood. Your fingers are stains with iniquity. And your lips have spoken lies. And your tongue has mortal preserveness. Because you never call for justice. That nor any pleaded for truth. They trust in vanity. They speak lies and they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. The Bible says you are like those in verse 5 that hash the cockroach egg, that wave the spider web, and eats anybody that eats of your wickedness dies. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. You are like the devil. There is no difference. Though you keep saying, I bind Satan, I bind Satan, there is no difference between your character and his. But God is saying today, despite all this evil that you have just measured, something can still be done. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60 from verse 1. The Lord says, Arise and shine. Arise and shine. After you have understood the foundation of the Holy Spirit, after you knew that the Spirit in you has moved over the surfaces of your affliction, of your pain, and of your torment, time has come to arise. Time has come to stand up and say enough is enough for the devil. Time has come to arise and to say to all affliction and pain, today is your last day. Ah, time has come to look at the enemy within the face and say my God has arrived. The Bible says, arise and shine. Do you know why? Your light has come. Your light has come. Because the glory of the Lord is rising. Is rising. Oh, Masakaraba, Ojara. Rekebo Santaraba. It doesn't matter the darkness that covers the earth. It doesn't matter the gross darkness that covers the people. Because you have hope. Because the Holy Spirit is you. Ah, the Bible says in verse 2, Darkness may cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the glory of the Lord has risen. Oh, and His glory shall be seen upon thee. The glory of the Lord is rising today. But this is where we're going to conclude for today. And glory of the Lord is rising upon your life today. The glory of the Lord is rising upon your business. The glory of the Lord is rising upon your finance fast. The glory of the Lord is rising upon your ministry, upon your marriage, upon the life of your children. Oh, it doesn't matter the darkness the enemy sent. Tell them, my hope is hidden in Christ and Christ in God. Oh, this is the time to arise. This is a time to look at your enemy and say, if I walk through the water, it will not overwhelm me. If I walk through the fire, it will not burn me. The Lord said, go through. It doesn't mean you will not go through. You will go through, but it will not consume you. It doesn't mean you will not move through the waters. 
You will go through the water. It will never swallow you up. God is telling you that problem you are going through, go through it. But the problem will never swallow you. But you will come out victorious. Always realize, without long suffering, there is no perfection. Christians must go through long suffering if they must reach perfection. God expects after you have suffered a while for you to become perfect. Christian need perfection. God will above all things is that you should be perfect. Just as he, the Lord your God, is a perfect God. Brethren, the hour has come to take the devil out of your business. To look at darkness and not share tears. But rather have hope in darkness. Be able to allow the Spirit of God into your darkness today. And I tell you there is a solution. I tell you there is a solution. I tell you there is a solution. I don't care to know what you are going through, but I have a message for you. There is a solution. I have a message for you. I say there is a solution. Your problem can be solved. Even if the doctor tells you there is no cure, tell the doctor is lying. There is a cure. The cure is not in the hands of the daughter. The cure is in the hands of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is hovering over it right now. And God is expecting you to speak life into that problem. God is expecting you to speak life into that clinic. God is expecting you to speak life into that sickness. God is expecting you to speak life into that finance. Oh, Matasa Kabarabosaya. The Lord that doeth what no man can do. Lord, I speak life to that sickness. I speak life to that waste pain right now. I speak life to that headache. I speak life, oh Lord, to that woman with an ear pain. Oh, Masagarabaho Chandaraya. The Lord that hear it. Ah, Father, I thank you for that man that is gloping around the darkness right now looking for who to lead him. I say, receive your sight in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord can see open that eye. The Lord can still open their eyes. Ah, the Lord can still open their eyes. Father Lord, I thank you because you hear me always. I thank you because you heard me already. I thank you because you heard me already. Father Lord, as many that sit in darkness, let light shine. As many that says, can we see anything good? Lord, goodness shall surpass their paths. Thank you, Father, because it is done. Brethren, the instruction I in the link below. Follow us every Saturday by 7 p.m. where we join together to train the trainer in our topic, Iron Sharpened Iron. Brethren, join us tomorrow, Sunday, by 5 p.m. where we gather together in our Open House Fellowship where we use opportunity to understand biblical prophecy in our